Um, well, real quick to remember to mute your sound, please. Uh, you keep your face on if you want, or um, just so that we don't interrupt our speaker. And then if you have questions, you can put them in your in the chat room. Um, and then we'll have some time. You can um, speak your question at the end of the program also. So, Rachel. Hey, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Rachel DeRosier, and I assist with our speakers and our field trips, and now also our social media. So look for us on Facebook and also Instagram. It'll either be the Sarah Noah chapter of Florida Native Plant Society or on Instagram, Sarah Noah FNPS. And if any of you are in our Facebook group, it's separate from our group. We have an actual Facebook page. So please like and follow us. And this evening we have Ashley Ellis. She is the Residential Horticulture Master Gardener Coordinator at University of Florida IFAS Sarasota County Extension. The Residential Horticulture Program provides research-based gardening and landscaping information to the residents of Sarasota. Ashley is interested in environmental horticultural practices that focus on preservation of natural resources and landscaping for wildlife. Ashley, I'll let you to it. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I am Ashley Ellis, and I'm the Residential Horticulture Agent and Master Gardener Coordinator for UF IFAS Sarasota County Extension and Sustainability. And I oversee the Master Gardener Volunteer Program in Sarasota County and provide sustainable landscaping education to the community. I have a background in wildlife ecology, which is the study of relationships between living organisms, including humans in their physical environment. To create healthy landscapes, it's vital to understand the connections between plants and animals and the world around them. Incorporating native plants or preserving existing native plants in your landscape is the starting point for maintaining the historic connection between our local ecological communities. In this presentation, you will learn strategies for designing an attractive home landscape and plant recommendations that will support wildlife throughout the year. So UF IFAS Extension, Sarasota County, it's a county, state, and federal partnership. We translate research into community initiatives, classes, and volunteer opportunities related to 4-H youth development, agriculture, gardening and landscaping, natural resources, nutrition, healthy living, and sustainability. The University of Florida is committed to providing universal access to all of our events for disability accommodations, such as sign language interpreters and listening devices, please contact our office at 941-861-9900. Advanced notice is necessary to arrange for some accessibility needs. And that reminds me, I should be putting on our closed captions. I don't know if I have control of doing that. Okay. Did you find it? It may not be with our account, so I'm not sure. So in our office, we have several agents and community outreach specialists that provide programming on Florida-friendly landscaping, natural resources, water quality and conservation, waste reduction, agriculture, sustainability, nutrition and healthy living, school and community gardening, and 4-H. We also have a Sea Grant agent that provides marine science and conservation programming. And we also are, have a certified instructors for the Florida Master Naturalist Program. Our office is also supported by volunteers in the 4-H program and Master Gardener Volunteer Program. At our Twin Lakes office, Master Gardener volunteers are on site Monday through Wednesday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., greeting visitors, taking soil and water samples for in-house testing, reviewing plant and insect samples for pest ID, nutrient deficiencies, or plant stress or disease. The Master Gardener volunteers follow up with visitors with research-based horticultural information to address their specific landscaping concerns. We offer programming at our Twin Lakes Extension office off of Clark Road in Sarasota and across the county and in webinars like this. To stay informed, you can sign up for our office newsletter on the UF IFAS Sarasota County Extension website. Follow us on our Facebook or search for our programming on our UF IFAS for them like page. 
So in this presentation, the main topics that we're going to cover are number one, and uh, I apologize, you guys are the Native Plant Society, so a lot of these things I'm sure you're well versed in, but I give this presentation to um, the, the public at large. So some of these things will probably be repeat for you, but um, we're going to talk about our local growing region, um, our the Florida seasons, how to landscape design tips for attracting wildlife, plant selection criteria, and plants by season. So the USDA hardiness zones are based on the average lowest temperatures, helping you choose plants that can survive the winter. You use the zones as a guide for selecting the plants best suited for your area. Sarasota County spans two growing regions, 9B and 10A. The interior section of Sarasota County is subject to lower temperatures than our coastal areas by a difference of about five degrees. Our coastal areas are also subject to salt spray, which is an important consideration when selecting plants. Airborne salt can affect trees and palms through twigs and foliage or through roots after it is deposited on the ground and penetrates into the soil. Trees planted within an eight miles of saltwater coastline should possess some degree of tolerance to aerosol salt spray. Those exposed to direct spray along the dunes should be highly salt tolerant. Technically speaking, many people consider October to be the start of Florida's dry season. While the rain starts to lit up around October, from a landscape perspective, our soils are still moist and plants are starting to slow down for the season. On the contrary, in the spring, the land has been drier for months, all while the plants are awakening for spring prominence. Native plants are naturally adapted to our local weather, climate, and soil conditions, making them better choices for our residential landscapes to reduce plant failure and excess inputs into the environment. There are several weather patterns that signify the start of rainy season in central Florida. Cold fronts stop moving through central Florida. Frequent almost daily showers and or thunderstorms form mainly along sea breeze collision. Low temperature and dew point are consistently between 67 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Our rainy season also coincides with Sarasota County's fertilizer ordinance, which prohibits the use of fertilizers containing nitrogen. Outside of the rainy season, if fertilizer is needed, UF recommends at least 50% slow release fertilizer and fertilizers low in phosphorus since our soils are naturally high in this. While it's important to understand Florida's tropical climate, this presentation has been created to encourage people to connect to the subtle changes that can be observed in our native plants that can serve as harbingers of winter, spring, summer, and fall. Being from New England, where these seasons are so distinct, it's taken me a few years to to develop a sense for our seasons by exploring our natural areas and observing wildlife patterns. So the next few slides are gonna go over some techniques for creating a living landscape through understanding temporal wildlife patterns, vertical layering and grouping or clumping plants. When designing a landscape to support wildlife, we need to consider temporal patterns such as our spring and fall migrating birds. For example, these graphs, um, last year fall bird migration in Sarasota County occurred between September and October and peaking in late October. In this spring, migratory bird movement has been observed in mid-March and has historically peaked in May. When thinking about plant selection, we certainly want to have a diversity of fruit and seed bearing plants available during these times. Even more importantly, we need landscapes that support a healthy insect population. Most terrestrial resident birds rely on large numbers of insects during the breeding season. About 96% of North American terrestrial birds rear their young in part or entirely on grubs and caterpillars. Long distance migration is physiologically and ecologically costly. Protein and fat-laden lepidoptera, which are butterflies and moths, help to offset those costs. Not only are caterpillars important components of nestling diets, but they are also required in great numbers. It requires many thousands of these insects to bring a clutch to independence. For example, Carolina chickadees feed young 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars before fledging, depending on the number of chicks in the nests and continue to feed fledglings insects for weeks after they leave the nest. 
Native plants have adapted defense mechanisms to our local pests, which eliminates the need for pesticides that are harmful to this important food source. As gardeners, uh, I, I see a lot in our landscape people wanting to incorporate uh, larval food sources for a lot of our butterflies and something to consider when gardening for wildlife are some of these butterflies like monarchs, um, viceroys, um, the brightly colored, usually red and orange, yellow, and black insects are um, harmful to birds. So keeping that in mind, um, it's good to have diversity in the landscape. So you want to also attract a diversity of pollinators that can also be consumed by other animals. So vertical layering, it's a multi-layered approach to your lawn using grass, ground cover, bushes or shrubs, and trees of different heights. It creates a diverse habitat that provides more home cooling ability and cover for wildlife that utilize plants in different ways. Bees like to focus on flowers of similar structure, and so grouping flowers of similar structure together while designing the landscape will work in sync with their preferences. It is best to plant in layers, replicating nature. Also consider providing snags and brush piles. As trees become diseased or die, consider leaving them standing as snags. Many wildlife species use snags for feeding and nesting. While nest boxes supply homes for many species, some woodpeckers will only use cavities they excavated themselves thus the need for snags. And many of the insects that occur in snags are food for woodpeckers and other bird species. So cover is critical for attracting wildlife to landscape. Cover provides protection from predators, extreme heat and wind. And cover also provides habitat for insects that are important food source for many vertebrates. So on the left uh, is a picture of a trunk of a cabbage palm. I just took this the other day at Shamrock Park a Nature Center. You can see there's these little white round eggs in there and I believe those belong to some kind of lizard. So you can see having uh, selecting trees and palms that have rough bark or intricate bark also promotes the use of other animals. Uh, in the picture of the cabbage palm there, you can see there's brown fronds that are hanging down uh, at the base of the canopy. And keeping those are really important for also attracting wildlife. Bats and birds like to use those areas um, for cover. And then up at the top, you have a sweet acacia tree. And in that picture, you've got these long thorns. Thorny plants are also really great for encouraging uh, wildlife to use your property as well. And in the lower right hand corner, you've got a picture of a fence with a trellis and it's coral honeysuckle that's growing, creeping along the top of that fence and birds really like to use that dense foliage for, for cover. So some really great choices there for how to incorporate cover into your landscape. Water can also be a limiting factor, particularly when we experience long periods between precipitation events. Water features add an element of movement and beauty to the landscape and a focal point that enhances your wildlife viewing opportunities. Here in Florida, freshwater is never far away, but if there are substantial obstacles such as fences or roads, installing a small pond with a flowing water feature can quickly fill that void. Even a small bird bath can make a huge difference. Just be sure to clean it regularly to limit issues with mosquitoes or pathogen buildup. Also, you wanna make sure that the bird bath itself doesn't have a shiny slick Glaze to avoid slips. The location of the water feature is also important. It should be located near cover so that birds can feel safe when using. So in this presentation, um, this is the criteria that I used for our plant selection. I wanted to first make sure that it's native to our specific local growing region, that they're commercially available, and that they're primarily the plants that are on this list are adapted for upland habitats. Because for the most part, our yards are generally uplands. I'm sure some of us on the call may have some low lying areas, maybe even fortunate enough to have part of a wetland on your property. But most of the plants we're talking about here are gonna be um, drought tolerant and suitable for upland habitats. Um, we're also gonna talk about the wildlife value. So, the plants that are on this list have some kind of value, whether it's 
for food, cover, or nesting. And when I'm talking about wildlife throughout here, I'm also including insects in that definition. And lastly, the plants that are on this list are, are featured by season. So to kind of wrap my head around this project, I started doing some research and I developed this long spreadsheet here. Um, we're not gonna go over all of these species. We only have a short period together tonight. So I've just highlighted a few of them, but I just wanted you to know that this is one, not a comprehensive list. Um, there's probably many, many more species that could be added to this. So if you have a favorite that's not highlighted tonight, um, I do encourage you to reach out to me and let me know like, hey, you know, I've seen you know, wildlife really enjoying this plant in my yard or it's done really well. Um, I'd love to hear those things so I can keep this list um, updated. And I, when, I, when I developed the list, when we talk about vertical layering, um, you can see I've categorized the species by tree, um, the height of it, um, whether it's a palm, shrubs, and then we go into wildflowers, grasses, ground covers, and vines. So incorporating a little bit of each one of these into the landscape will help with that vertical um, structure. So large shade trees are not highlighted in my presentation, although they play a critical role, role in supporting wildlife. The shade provides respite during our long hot summers and protection during storm events. Some birds may nest in shade trees while others like warblers and flycatchers are often seen flitting about consuming flying insects. Depending on the size of your property, at least one or two shade trees should be incorporated to promote a healthy living landscape for diversity of wildlife. There's a lot to learn about trees and in Sarasota County, we have a number of Arbor Day events that are happening um, through extension. I've got a slide here advertising that. So do look out for this. Uh, we've got coming up on Wednesday, just a couple of days from now, we're gonna be at the Northport Library from one to 2.30. And we'll be talking about trees for the Sun Coast and we'll also be doing tree giveaways. And then we'll also have another event Saturday, April 22nd from one to 2.30. That's gonna be at Twin Lakes Extension. And then Friday, if you can't make it in person, we're gonna have a Zoom actually on Arbor Day, which is April 28th. And that's gonna be from 6.30 to eight. And we'll be talking about trees for the Sun Coast. And if we still have trees left over, um, you'll be eligible to pick up a tree at extension after the presentation. So how you sign up for these is through our Eventbrite. If you Google UF IFAS Sarasota County Extension Eventbrite, or you follow this link, you will come to our Arbor Month events and you can sign up individually. Um, you can also contact our Florida Friendly Landscaping Specialist, Forrest Hacker, at the number and email below. And if you have any questions, you can also contact me. So let's get into it. So this next series of plants are going to be those that pack the most punch in the winter. And I realized that a lot of the plants that we're gonna highlight here have benefits throughout the year, but I tried to um, highlight some of those that have the, their most benefits in a particular season. So sweet acacia, this is one of my favorites. And I think you're gonna hear me say that's like every single one of the species I've highlighted here, but it's a tall semi evergreen native shrub or small tree. It's got feathery, finely divided leaflets of a soft medium green color. Uh, it's slightly rough stems. It's a rich chocolate brown or gray. They possess long, sharp, multiple thorns. The small, bright yellow puff-like flowers are very fragrant and appear in clusters in late winter when sporadically after each new flush of growth, providing nearly year-round blooms. The persistent fruits have a glossy coat and contain seeds which are cherished by birds and other wildlife. Some suggestions would be not to locate the tree too close to where people can be injured by the sharp thorns or the branches. They grow in any acid or alkaline soil, including clay, and they grow best in full sun.
wild lime. It's another small to medium tree. It's an evergreen shrub or small tree. It blooms year round with peak flowering in the winter and spring. Its dense foliage provides cover and its fruit provides food for birds and small wildlife. The plant is the larval host for several butterflies, including the giant and shallow swallowtails. And you'll notice as we go through these slides, um, I've got a, a table there that talks about the height and spread, the growth rate, um, the light conditions, the, whether it's drought tolerant, which most of the plants here are. Um, some of the items I couldn't find solid information on, so I, I just left them blank. Um, so more research might be needed to kind of figure out what the salt tolerance is for wildlife or wind resistance. Firebush, it's a large soft stemmed shrub that reaches a height and width of eight to 12 feet tall without support. A one foot tall specimen that is planted in the spring can be expected to reach five feet or more by the following winter. It can grow to 15 feet tall or more if given support on a trellis or other structure. The petiole and young stems also appear red. Bright orange red flowers appear in forking signs at the tips of the branches throughout the year. The slender flowers are tubular and reach a length of one to one and a half inches, although tolerant of shade flowering is much reduced. Hummingbirds and butterflies enjoy the nectar in the flowers and the small black glossy fruits are rounded and can be eaten. There's a continuous crop of these seedy fruits and birds are quite fond of them. The firebrush can be used as a foundation plant for large buildings and is superb when placed in the background of a mass of shrubs in a border. It is an excellent screen plant. Tea bush is another uh, favorite plant of mine. It's really great year round, um, but I have it here listed in the winter because it's also a beautiful flowering plant in the winter. Um, it's usually covered in lots of pollinators, bees, wasps, beetles, flies. Um, it also brings a color of silver to uh, our landscapes, which are often very green. Um, there's two varieties that are generally available, the woolly or pyramidal. Um, the woolly has more of a round habit and the pyramidal has more of a weeping habit. Kunti, like all cycads, um, it has ancient origins. It is the only cycad native to North America. It's also the preferred food source for larvae of the rare atala butterfly, which is featured here in the middle of your screen. Um, we actually have a population of these Atala butterflies at our extension office. Um, they kind of were kicked back a little bit from the cold and we think that mosquito management may have come by and done some spraying in our bioswale and unfortunately they were hit by some of that as well. So our population's gone down a little bit, but they're still around. We're hoping they rebound. So it's if you're a butterfly hunter and you wanna see this rare butterfly, definitely come swing by extension and check it out. Um, cycads, uh, the cone also produces seeds prized by small mammals. Uh, it looks like a small fern and it's typically one to three feet tall. It has stiff, glossy feather-like leaves attached to a thick, short underground stem. Florida's native peoples once ground up the stems to create a starchy flour for cooking. But don't try this yourself. The stem is toxic unless prepared properly. Because of its high drought tolerance and moderate salt tolerance, the kunti is an excellent choice for the coastal landscape. And it's cold hardy too. Kuntis can be planted in sun or shade, and they can be used as a specimen plant or in foundation and mass plantings. Cocoa plum. It makes an excellent landscape plant. There's two cultivars in our area. One is more for coastal landscapes and the other is more for inland landscapes. All cultivars may be used for screening and hedging. The coastal form is highly salt tolerant and has a moderate growth rate. It forms densely foliated mounds from ground to top, which are typically wider than high and usually not more than six feet tall. Spreading low growing plants are likely to form dense thickets. A horizontal cultivar of the coastal form is favored for planting as a ground cover around houses. In commercial landscapes and 
roadway and medians. It's especially useful where an obstructed view of the waterfront is desired. Red-tipped is a cultivar of the inland form of cocoa bum. The color of the new leaf growth is burgundy red, becoming yellowish green and then dark green. The mature fruit color is usually purple. The cultivar has more of the dominant cocoa bum hedge of South Florida. Fresh fruit picked from the plants are edible. Early immigrants to Florida discovered that the fruit's unique flavor, fleshy consistency, and thin skin made it excellent for making jams and jellies, and it is still used for the purpose today. This in, the seeds inside the pit can be roasted and eaten for their almond-like flavor or crushed and added to the jelly. The fruit are readily consumed by gopher tortoises and other wildlife. Nectar from the flowers produce a dark colored honey. And it's a pretty moderate grower. So if you look in the left-hand corner of this slide, you'll see um, a series of the red tip cocoa plum that were recently installed. And then just after uh, one season, they've grown up almost to three, four, four feet in height. Um, so they make a really great uh, hedge as well. And then in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that's that horizontal cultivar of that coastal um, cocoa plum that's low growing and spreading. It can kind of be used as a ground cover. This is another one of my favorite vines, um, Carolina jessamine. It's a great plant for winter color and is one of the first flowers to emerge in Florida in early January. It's easy to grow, vine adapts well to fences and trellises where its small leaves and twining stems create an airy light appearance. It sometimes grows as an open trailing ground cover in the woods and also creates cascades of brilliant yellow as it grows up into trees and trails off branches. Its fragrant flowers typically bloom from winter through spring and will attract hummingbirds, butterflies, and large bees who will wiggle their way inside its tubular flowers. So moving into spring, we've got a couple of fledgling of bluebirds here eating some worms. And Florida privet is a great choice for the landscape. Um, it can be successfully used as a specimen or a hedge. It's an ideal plant for the shady edge of a garden. The flowers typically appear in early spring before leaves emerge, but the plant may bloom year round. Bees and butterflies are attracted to the flowers. Birds and small mammals use the dense foliage for cover and are partial to the abundant fruit that ripens in early summer when few fruits are available. It is dioecious, which means both a male and a female specimen are needed to ensure pollination and fruit. It is drought insult tolerant and is generally evergreen in our area. Fringe tree is a small deciduous tree that bursts into bloom in the spring. The flowers are composed of narrow ribbon-like petals that are snowy white. In fact, the fringe tree's botanical name means snow flower. All belong to the family Oleaceae or the olive family. And female fringe trees will produce dark olive-like fruits that mature in late summer and early fall. While not edible to humans, these fruits are attracted to birds. Fringe trees are ideal for planting in urban areas due to their pollution tolerance and ability to adapt to a range of soil types. These trees are not ideal for the coast, however, as they are not salt tolerant. So these would be more appropriate in the inland portions of our county. Marlberry is a 12 to 15 foot tall shrub. Uh, the small white fragrant flowers occur in dense terminal panicles that are five inches in length. Flowers are born at intervals throughout the year, but do not last very long. In the late spring, this plant bears its small purple fruit. Marlberry is a great and mixed group in background plantings. It can be trained into a small tree by removing lower foliage and branches to expose the interesting trunk pattern. The multiple trunks become an interesting element in the landscape and they look nice lighted at night. Space them 15 feet apart along an entrance road or sidewalk to create a nice linear planting of multi-trunk small trees. Since they will remain quite dense even in partial shade, they make a great screen for residential landscapes. The shrub prefers well-drained soils and a semi-shade to full sun location in the landscape. It will grow in soils with a wide pH range. Jamaican caper is another one of my favorites. It's versatile and attractive plant for use in coastal landscapes. 
It has brush-like fragrant flowers that open white, turning to pink purple. Typical flowering time is from April to June. Flowers are open in the evening and are pollinated by night flying moths attracted to the fragrance, which is more pronounced at night. Honeybees also frequent the flowers. It provides a significant food and cover for wildlife, including many birds which eat the fruit. And it's an excellent mid canopy option for wildlife gardens. Netted pawpaw, it's a deciduous flowering shrub found in pine and scrubby flatwoods, sandhills, and coastal scrub habitats throughout peninsular Florida. It blooms late winter through spring, producing many flowers that attract a wide variety of butterflies. The plant is a larval host for the zebra's swallowtail and pawpaw sphinx moth. The fruits which appear in spring and summer are a favorite of birds and small mammals. Netted pawpaw's fragrant showy flowers are creamy white. So moving into our summer season, we have our cabbage palm, which is Florida's state tree, which palms are not a tree, but nonetheless, it is our state tree and is ideal for coastal locations. It has a rough fibrous trunk that provides plenty of crevices for insects. Cabbage palm is topped with a very dense 10 to 15 foot diameter round crown. The four to five foot long creamy white showy flower stalks in the summer are followed by small shiny green to black fruits which are abolished by squirrels, raccoons, and other wildlife. It's about as hurricane proof as a tree can be. They stand after many hurricanes have blown over the oaks and snapped the pines in two. They adapt well to small cutouts in the sidewalk and can even create shade if planted on six to ten foot centers. Ganoderma butt rot is perhaps the most serious disease of cabbage palms. It kills palms, which it infects. The disease enters the trunk primarily through injuries on the lower trunk and roots. Um, avoid irrigating the trunk to uh, avoid Ganoderma. There's no control for Ganoderma at this time, only prevention. Um, and the UF suggests that if you do have Ganoderma on your palm to remove the infected palm as soon as possible and not to replant another palm in its place because the spores of that fungus are gonna be in the soil and stay there for a very long time. Yalpon holly, it's one of the most durable and adaptable of the small-leaved evergreen hollies for use in Southern landscapes. It produces small red berries in the winter and it also provides color in the winter landscape. It's a great food source for birds. It's small white flowers attract bees for several weeks. It can be installed as a specimen tree, but more often used as a hedge. It's important to purchase tree with berries already present to ensure that it is female. Female has the showy flowers. Um, both are multi-trunked. It requires little pruning and roots are not a problem. It's very resistant to pests and diseases. It's also the only plant native North American species to contain caffeine and has more of it than coffee or green tea. The leaves and stems may be used fresh, dried, or roasted. And there are several companies out there now that sell Yaopan Holly tea you can buy. Fiddlewoods, another one of my favorites. It's normally seen as a shrub. Um, it can grow to about 35 feet tall in its native habitat in South Florida. So it can also be a small tree. The leaves are unusually glossy with smooth margins and a distinctive bowed venation pattern. The plant produces several trunks, which if left untrained, eventually gives rise to a multi-stem shrub or small tree. Small white showy flowers produced in the summer months contrast nicely with the shiny foliage. Young plants can be upright and rounded. Older specimens develop a rounded base form with lower branches removed. Fiddlewood is most useful planted six to eight feet apart as a screen or hedge plant along a property line. Its large size makes it suited for a tall hedge. The canopy on the shade grown plants becomes thin and regular. Those in full sun remain dense and cast deep shade in a small area. The berries are eaten by many species of birds and other wildlife. It's also the larval host for a fiddlewood leaf roller moth and a nectar plant for butterflies. It attracts bees and pollinators. Simpson Stopper will provide your landscape with springtime flowering, colorful berries, and evergreen leaves. Not only does it look great, this plant is versatile. 
It can function as a shrub or a small tree depending on the cultivar and how you prune it. It's lovely in the garden any time of year. The evergreen leaves of this woody native co contrast nicely with new growth, which can range in color from pale chartreuse to deep wine. The leaves are also fragrant when crushed, giving off a spicy citrusy scent similar to nutmeg. The exfoliating bark of Simpson Stopper also provides some visual interest year round. Outer bark flakes off to real bark in shades of reddish brown. The look of your plant will depend on the amount of sun it gets. When planted in full sun, Simpson Stopper forms a densely growing plant that makes a great hedge. In partial shade, the foliage is less dense, but this just affords a better view of the exfoliating bark. Flowering occurs generally in April and May in Florida. The showy white flowers, which also are fragrant, are followed by orange to red berries in late summer and early fall. While these berries are edible for humans, accepting the seeds, they are not often considered palatable. Simpson stopper is great for attracting butterflies, bees, and birds. The flowers bring in the pollinators and the dense canopy offers protection for birds, which also feed on the small red fruits. It's found growing naturally in seaside hammocks. Simpson stopper is a great choice for coastal gardeners looking for a plant that's tolerant of salt and alkaline growing conditions. Beauty Berry is a small sprawling shrub. It's about three to eight feet tall and four to eight feet wide that works well in borders or as a specimen plant. The branches form long arches that bend toward the ground. Pruning will keep the plant more compact, but be sure to prune before the plant flowers. The deciduous leaves are light green, coarse, and fuzzy. Small pale lavender pink flowers appear along the branches from spring to summer and then mature into jewel-like fruits by September. The showy clusters of shiny purple fruits are densely packed and encircle the woody stems. The fruits will persist for several weeks after the plant drops its leaves. Walter's viburnum is an excellent choice as an accent plant, both for its form and its early spring flowers. It also makes a great hedgerow or border plant and can be planted in masses. Plants can send up suckers, but they can be kept in check with timely pruning. It is moderately fast growing, extremely adaptable to a broad range of conditions and hurricane wind resistant. Pollinators are attracted to its showy spring flower clusters while birds and other wildlife feast on its abundant summer and fall fruit production and use its dense foliage for nesting and cover. Walter's viburnum has fine dense foliage that add texture to the landscape. Its branches provide a nesting site for songbirds and the species a host plant for the spring azure butterfly larva. Viburnums are suitable for mass plantings in residential or commercial landscapes. Because their height is limited, viburnums are good choices for street side plantings and under power lines. Viburnums can also grow in a garden or as a patio tree. Butterfly weed is a member of the milkweed family. The plants grow to two feet tall and flowers from July to September. The flowers colors are orange, red, and yellow. The plant will not flower freely until well established. The best sites have exposure to sun or partial shade in almost any soil. The plant tolerates dry soil, but not heavy soil. Butterfly weed is slow to start growth in the spring. Mark its location to prevent damage to easily injured dormant crowns. The leaves can be stripped by caterpillars and the plant often looks stick-like at certain times of the year. So using ground cover also helps hide the bare stems until they can be cut back. Pair with plants with large foliage and mounding or loose spreading forms to help the butterfly weed poke through the plants. White or purple flowers are complementary colors to yellow and red, which will contrast nicely. The larval hosts, it's a larval host of the monarch butterfly, queen butterfly, and soldier butterfly. Blazing star is easy to grow and once established requires little maintenance. It will die back in the winter, but will persist through prolific self-seeding and by production of new underground corms. Because of its somewhat brief flowering period, it's about two to three weeks, it is best used in a mixed planting, although it is quite attractive in a mass planting. The flower spikes can make the plants top heavy, so plant with other tall species such as grasses, goldenrods, and sunflowers that can help support the plant and keep it upright. It blooms in late summer and through fall and is an excellent attractor of butterflies, bees, and other beneficial insects. 
Gopher apple is a low-growing clonal evergreen shrub reaching heights of less than one and a half feet that spreads via stout underground stems. Flowers are white, born in terminal clusters, and commonly extend past the leaves. They are inconspicuous and appear from April to summer. And currently, the pictures that you're looking at there were taken just a few days ago, again, at Shamrock Park and Nature Center, where that's in flower. Gopher apple gets its name because gopher tortoises, along with other small mammals, eat their fruit. Gopher apple is an ideal ground cover for a coastal landscape with well-draining soil and a low pH. Butterflies, including buckeyes, rattlebox moths, wasps, ants, and bees use the flowers, and bees are the primary pollinators. Now, moving into fall. So this image I thought was pretty cool. Um, again, trying to highlight um, temporal patterns of wildlife, right? Our fall, in fall, we have lots of neotropical migrant birds that are coming down our way. Um, and this image was actually captured by weather radar. It wasn't intending to capture bird movement, but it was such a large mass of birds over the Florida Keys that it actually picked up on the weather radar. So I thought that was kind of cool. So another plant for the fall, oh, skipped ahead. Our sweet bay magnolia. It's related to the well-known southern magnolia. The differences are that its evergreen leaves have a silvery underside and its creamy white lemon scented flowers are smaller in size. It can grow to a mature height of 50 feet in the north or to 60 feet in the south. Trees glimmer in the wind due to the whitish green underside of the leaves. They provide excellent vertical definition in a shrub border or as a freestanding specimen and flourish in moist acidic soil. The creamy white lemon scented flowers appear from June through September and are followed by small red seeds, which are used by a variety of wildlife. It can be trained into a multi-trunk spreading specimen plant or left with the central leader intact as a wide column. The plant serves as host for Palamedes swallowtail butterflies, spicebush swallowtail, and tiger swallowtail butterfly larva. Persimmon, the first time I saw this out in the field, I had couldn't believe it. I didn't realize that we had these down here. But they uh, prefer moist, well-drained bottomland or sandy soils. Um, they're very drought and urban tolerant. Its fruit is an edible berry that usually ripens after frost, although most cultivars do not require the frost treatment to ripen. Most American cultivars require both male and female trees for proper fruiting. You wanna locate it where the fruit will not fall on sidewalks and cause people to slip and fall. The wood of this tree is actually used for golf club heads. It's uh, the very hard and almost black wood on a golf club if you, if you ever picked up a club before. The fruit are about one inch in diameter and the color when ripe ranges from a yellow orange to a dark red orange. They ripen just in time for Halloween from September to October and usually after the tree has lost its leaves and has fragrant flowers. Yellow tops, now this is a video. I don't know if you guys will be able to see it very easily, but this was taken at extension. This past fall, we have a pollinator garden in our extension office at Twin Lakes that um, it's, it's a great demonstration garden. If you guys ever get the chance to come over to our office, I highly recommend taking a stroll through the pollinator garden um, to see what types of plants um, you could have in your own landscape. But this yellow tops was for weeks just covered in all kinds of different pollinators. There were butterflies, bees, beetles, wasps, uh, all kinds of different wasps and beetles. It was really, really cool. I've never seen so many different insects on one plant. Um, so it's, it's used kind of as a tall growing ground cover. It forms mounds that are typically wider than tall. Um, you wanna cut it back to the ground after flowering and it's also easily grown from seed. Giant ironweed. So it's a long-lived perennial that reaches three to 10 feet in height. 
Um, it blooms from July to October, dark purple flowers in large masses. It's a great pollinator plant and nectar source. It'll attract hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies. And then muley grass, if you guys are here in the fall, I'm sure you have seen this out and about in many landscapes. It's a tough native grass. It's, um, it has extreme tolerance to drought and flooding, making it suited for wetland sites as well as beachfront landscapes. Um, it makes a nice fine textured mass planting for sites ranging from roadside to residential landscapes. Um, we suggest planting them in large sweeping drifts on a large landscape for a dramatic effect. It is virtually maintenance free, except in those instances where you might want to remove the brown foliage in the spring by cutting the clump back to the ground before any new growth emerges. The delicate purple flowers emerge in the fall well above the foliage and can literally cover the foliage. It is native to pine flatwoods, coastal uplands, and beach dunes and sandhill communities. And from a wildlife perspective, um, when you plant these in masses like this, they provide great cover. I use these in my own landscape and um, I noticed the, the rabbits in my neighborhood uh, tend to hang out in these areas. They feel quite protected there. And that gets us through our seasons. Um, here are some of the resources that I use to develop this list. Um, I use several different books. Craig Hugel, he's a fantastic. Um, wildlife author and plant author locally. He writes a lot on Florida's landscapes. Um, he had some really great books out there that I was able to use. Um, a number of different web resources. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Extension, we have um, the electronic database online, the EDIS. If you Google EDIS, um, you can look up almost any kind of landscaping question there is out there. There's probably a fact sheet or um, some kind of article on it, blog. Um, same with gardening solutions. There's lots of um, information out there on all these different plants. I also consulted with the Florida Plant Atlas online to make sure that whatever plants are on this list are native to our region. And I think that's it. So sorry, I kind of sped through that, but I wanted to catch you guys out on time. <laughs> Usually this is like an hour, over an hour. <laughs> um, I think I, I think I did this in maybe a half hour, 40 minutes, hopefully. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me? Any questions about extension or the Master Gardener program or our plant clinic? I think one of the Looking questions in the was, chat and I was, see somebody's put in, let's see, I'll get, I'm going to get through these, but the starting from the bottom, someone's written, what are the symptoms of Ganoderma? Um, if you, if you search uh, IFAS, I-F-A-S and Ganoderma, you will get a bunch of pictures, but essentially it's, it's hard to tell until you see the conch, but it's a shelf mushroom. So it's this white, um, it's this white growth at the base of the cabbage bomb. And it's, it eventually turns into a shelf mu mushroom. But as soon as you see even like a white, white ball, almost like a golf ball, it's like the beginning of that fungus, it's gonna be Ganoderma. So unfortunately there's no, um, cure for that at this time. So the recommendation is to remove that palm immediately because you don't want that fungus to mature and then put out more spores and get that into the environment and affect more palms. I'm happy to share that with you. So if um, I think someone's emailed me a list of the registrants of this meeting, um, if I get a list of all your emails and I can I can share that with the group. I think that's everything. Uh, okay, someone's wanting a 
a copy of the presentation. Yeah, I should be able to, um, it's 51 slides. I should be able to create um, like a PDF and I could share it that way. Um, so if you guys have one main contact, maybe it's Rachel. Um, if you wanna shoot me an email looking for this stuff, um, just as a reminder, I can share it with the group. And then if you want, or I can share it with her and then she can distribute it to the group. I believe the We're presentation also, um, has been recorded also. You know, so happy to have folks at Extension. Um, we give a number of different presentations. Um, always looking for new ideas. So if there's a special topic, um, horticulture related that you're interested in, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and um, we'll connect you with some resources or perhaps develop some programming. Um, depending on the topic. I think that's everything in the chat. Anything, anybody else? You feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions for me, for me before we head off here. Ashley, I put our um, email address in the um, chat, but for the FNPS chapter, for Saranoa chapter, it's srepins at gmail. And if you send the slides to that, then we will post the link for people. We'll put them up somewhere and share them. All right, I don't uh, see any hands up or... I just want, I want to mention that it, it, it's, a nice, it's, a very, it's a very nice comprehensive list, um, Ashley. Um, the plants are on there. One thing- Tom, I uh, think you're muted. Um, or... I can't, I'm, I think, um, Allison, can you unmute me? Because I'm saying I'm unmuted. You're, yeah, no, I can't unmute you. You can only unmute um, yourself. I don't know why I'm not. It, it doesn't show that. It doesn't show that you're muted. I, I show. I can hear you. I, I can, can hear, hear you, Tom. So okay. it might be Ashley having a problem with her her microphone or headset. Well, it was a very comprehensive list. One thing I mentioned is, is a lot of the plants, people are looking for the fruiting plants and um, some of them that you, you mentioned, uh, of course, hollies or Florida privet, you mentioned that is um, males and females, dioecia, so you want the fruit, but a lot of the other ones you mentioned are also um, dioecia, uh, meaning that you wanna get the females for the fruit, like the uh, fiddlewood, wild lime, um, sea grape that wasn't on there. Um, a bit. wax myrtle they're, they're all dioecious so if you're looking for the fruiting it's, it's uh, you want to make sure you try to find those when you're purchasing the plant if it's available tom i did have a question for you um is there any way to to tell whether you have like the male or the female unless it's fruiting uh, the flowers, sometimes you can tell, um, but not really, unless they were done propagated vegetatively and the grower knows for sure. Um, if it's done by seed, typically across one of the literature I've read is uh, two thirds of the plants. If, if you sow a bunch of seeds from like holly trees, two thirds will be male and one third will be female typically. And so I think that goes about the same with other species, I would imagine you have you have more males out there than you do females. Um, but other than the flower, um, and then you see the fruit, like hollies are flowering right now, and you can you can tell the males and the females by looking at the flowers, and that's typical with most plants like that. Uh, fringe trees too, that's another one. They're dioecious also, males and females. Um, but it was good, great plant selection there. The list is really nice. I think it would be nice for our members to look at it because it's a very comprehensive list. And um, you mentioned something about availability and that's a good one. Um, pretty much all the plants you listed are available except for the uh, pawpaw, uh, the Semina reticulata, which is the one commonly found around here, but it's just not become available in the, uh, in the trade as of yet. So there's some growers working on that, but um, most of the other plants you mentioned are very available in the in the nursery trade now. Um, so that's kind of nice. 
And if the demand's there, more people will want the plants and more growers hopefully will start growing them. So. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I, I welcome feedback. So I'm happy to share this list. And if anybody has others, it's not a comprehensive list. There's many, many more species that could be added to it. And, you know, I'll share the resources that I use. There's books like, for example, um, I don't know if you can see this. This is another really good one. Um, I guess it's, Florida's Best Native Landscape Plants by Gil Nelson. Um, I really like this one too. There's a lot of great photos in there. The problem with that is it's it's for the whole state of Florida. It's not for our specific region. So you really have to drill down in it and make sure that it's going to be species that um, are appropriate for our area. Ashley, so. we have somebody who's raised their hand. William Lewis um, has a question. <laughs> yes, coming back on the muley grass, um, I had really poor results when they were planted within um, the um, drip zone of pines. And I was told that they do not tolerate acid at all, like the pine needles, that they're much more alkaline um, friendly. But yet you mentioned they were in pine flatwoods. Um, so are there different varieties of muley that may be more acid loving? That's a good question. From the research that I found, it said that muley grasses were quite tolerant of all soil types. Um, what type of pines do you have? This was previously, it was, slash, it was a slash pine and they were, you know, eight to 10 foot from the trunk. And, um, but that bed was pine needles. And those just did not thrive at all, but others that were in the sandy soil, other parts of the yard, without the pine needles, without the oak leaves, just did very well. Were and they in a lot of shade? No. No. It was sun, that, yeah. That's was the so one good. thing I've noticed. I have them kind of throughout my landscape. And in the shadier parts, they they're not doing quite as well. They don't get that really nice, big, beautiful bloom as they do in that full sun. Um, but yeah, I'll look into that and see if I can find something more. Tom, have you heard anything about that? Do you know if um, are I, I would say they prefer a little more alkaline soils, um, Bill um, or William, um, yeah. than, than acidic. Um, and there again, you know, my first thought was the shade too, if they, they do a little bit better if they're in more sun. So if they are getting some shade under some of the pine trees a little bit, I think that could affect them a little bit. So sometimes it's just moving them to a different spot if they're not doing well there and they are doing well in the other part of your yard, you know, it might be a better solution to, to move them. Thank you. Plants are tough. They always don't work in the right situation that we think even though all the literature says one thing um the proof is in the um in the actual planting so they don't always behave the way they say they're going to in the books oh. it's so true i had to change my list up so many times as i was doing this because one resource would say oh this is highly wind resistant and then this resource would say it wasn't or it blooms this time of year versus this time of year or the fruits this year. You know, so it was all these different. And I, I think that comes from um, looking at the state as a whole, you know, what a plant does in the North part of the state versus the South versus us in the central is gonna be different. So kind of have to pay attention to like where they're, where the author is from, where it seems that they're writing from too. Mm -hmm. Good point, very good point. Yeah, I've noticed um, the plant um, communities and blooming in Sarasota County is extremely different from Manatee County, where I've just moved to. Very different zones and habitats. Um, and on your sweet bay, one of the sweet bays I bought last year has a flower right now. Um, I think it's the Virginianica, Magnolia Virginianica. Mm -hmm. Whereas you had mentioned that it was a fall bloomer. Yeah. Well, I think she might have mentioned that it was it did bloom in like a June or something um, in the summertime, but 
Um, we have sweet bays that are in bloom right now too. So some things are coming out earlier there again. Um, some of the literature, it probably did typically bloom more in June and even up north, you know, the sweet bay grows all the way up into Ohio and there it would obviously bloom more in June, but here we get to enjoy the, the bloom, that's the smell of it um, right now. So April, May, probably. And also with the um, variable rain patterns and it being so much warmer, all of the plant responses are changing dramatically. Well, we have to get some new books written, I guess. And the hurricane. We've seen a lot of crazy things happening since the hurricane. A lot of um, trees like lost their leaves and then they came back. Like they had almost like hear a it? false spring in the fall. You're okay, right? No. You don't hear this. No. There we go. <laughs> I just muted that, so sorry. I also stopped sharing Ashley's screen so we could see each other better. Yeah, that's nice. So, well, it was a nice presentation. We had a good turnout. So, um, if anybody doesn't have any more questions, thank you for coming and thank you for, you got through it very well, Ashley. So, <laughs> I didn't mean to, to cut you short, but um, you got your points across very well. So, and a lot of good plans, like I mentioned, those are a lot of good um the, the basic plants, you know, it's a great start for everybody if they're trying to convert their yard to natives or just, you know, good plants for the yard to attract a lot of wildlife. So um, I really like the list. So good photos too. All right. Well, thanks for having me all. I'm a big fan of the Native Plant Society. I'm mm -hmm. a member of the mangrove chapter. So I'm sure I'll see some of you. I'm going to be, I'm always looking for field trip opportunities. So um, I'm sure I'll see some of you around. Okay. Um, very good. Well, thank you very much, Ashley. And, and thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, and one more meeting this year or so. Very good. Um, everybody have a good evening and we'll see you all soon. Thank okay. you so much, Ashley. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.